Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I realized yesterday in the evening that 11 years ago, when there was the first NOHA visit and seminar in, in Poland, um, Dr. Elżbieta Mikoskuza asked me to uh, start doing research on the safety of humanitarian personnel. It was like my first topic in this area. Uh, so I'm really happy to, uh, to be part of this panel today, um, protection of humanitarian staff. I welcome our distinguished guest, panelists, Alejandro Pozo from Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Robert Gosn from Belgium Red Cross, and uh, Jackson Mungoni from the Polish Humanitarian Action. I think uh, it's our great opportunity that we have you here, so please prepare tough questions. Uh, we have <laughs> really experienced people who, uh, and I'm sure we will enjoy this, uh, this time. Um, unfortunately, uh, the general news is bad. I think uh, things go worse and worse. The list of humanitarian workers who have been killed, who, who were victims, um, especially in the situation of armed conflicts, is longer and longer. Uh, so it's one of the most crucial problems, challenges, in the field of humanitarian aid, what could be done to protect humanitarian workers better. Of course, there are many, many uh, reasons uh, why the situation is like that. Humanitarian uh, workers fall victim to bombings, direct attacks, kidnapping, thefts, as well as collateral damage security incidents. And um, I think we can, we can admit that humanitarian workers have always been vulnerable, vulnerable group. Um, but even in the 90s, when I was a student, I remember uh, when the personnel of the Red Cross was, uh, committee was uh, like six workers were killed in Grozny during Russian Chechen war. It was a huge shock for international humanity. Plenty of discussion about this incident. Uh, and unfortunately, nowadays, hundreds of incidents or even more appear every, every year. Uh, there are many factors which have a negative impact on humanitarian space, uh, increasingly worse security conditions, um, high number of conflicts, the shift in the nature of conflicts, non-state participants of armed conflicts, cultural aspect, and generally the problem of disrespect for international humanitarian law, uh, human rights law. And probably there are also some internal factors which we can discuss today, lacking transparency, uh, increasing politicization or securitization of humanitarian action. So we have plenty of, plenty of problems to, to discuss. Um, I was also asked before our keynote speech, uh, which we'll be honored to, to hear, I was asked to introduce you to um, this legal, legal field, to give you a um, legal perspective. Uh, I think, I, I know that it's probably not the most interesting part, but um, law, international law, internal law, um, give us the context. Uh, like for, former Secretary General of the United Na Nations, he said that uh, if we lose the law, what are we left with? And that's why uh, it is important to start with law and to, to, to be aware of all, all rules which should be respected in different situations. Um, my preliminary uh, remark would be that there is no one legal, legal perspective in, for every time, every situation, and for every humanitarian worker. In situations outside of armed conflicts, the scope of that protection is determined by human rights law, as well as specific regimes, such as international disaster response law and convention on the safety of Huma United Nations and associated personnel of 1996, the optional protocol of 2005, 
In situations of armed conflict, further protection arises out of international humanitarian law, and there are some provisions in international criminal law on war crimes. And of course, every time we should take into account um, the national law. This regime is also uh, important. So the first part, part about outside of times of armed conflicts. Of course, human rights law, human rights protect the life and safety of every human being, which naturally pertains also to humanitarian workers. We know that under some conditions of public emergency, some human rights can be derogated by states, but some human rights cannot be repealed any time. And these rights are crucial. The right to life, the ban on, on torture or slavery. These regulations are crucial in the context of humanitarian aid because they guarantee the protection of life, should guarantee the protection of life and health of humanitarian workers and ensure the authorization to offer humanitarian aid. Because, of course, humanitarian aid contributes to um, the enjoyment of the right to life. Then, the responsibility of uh, states to ensure the safety of humanitarian workers is also um, mentioned in the guidelines for domestic facilities facilitation and regulation of international disaster relief and initial recovery assistance, which were adopted in 2007 by state parties to Geneva Conventions and International Red Cross uh, and Christian Movement. Uh, but these guidelines are not binding. Uh, but what was confirmed, uh, the duty of states to ensure the security of those under their jurisdiction. So, of course, these guidelines emphasize the duty of the helpers to take measures to mitigate the risk of their safety. But, first of all, duty of states to ensure security of humanitarian workers. Um, a particular regime also, um, which applies to humanitarian workers, was provided with um, the Convention on the Safety of United Nations and Associated Personnel. The purpose behind this convention was to enhance the protection of UN and Associated Personnel, who, as was noted in the preamble of this convention, make an important contribution to respect of UN efforts in the field of humanitarian operations. So the convention prohibits attacks on UN and Associated Personnel and any actions that prevent them from discharging their mandate and imposes on states the duty to take all appropriate measures to ensure the safety and security of UN and associated personnel. But of course, the question is who is UN personnel and especially associated personnel? Um, there is no time to go into details, but, for example, peacekeepers, representative of UN OCHA, UNHCR, can fall into this category. Protection under the Convention doesn't apply to all humanitarian workers, unfortunately. It only applies to those who work for organizations who have an agreement with UN Secretary General or some specialized agencies. Moreover, these workers are only protected when they carry out activities in support of the fulfillment of the mandate of UN operation. So, for example, local workers uh, of NGOs that may lack a formal agreement with UN are more vulnerable to attack, uh, yet beyond the scope of protection offered by the Convention. So it's hardly an acceptable situation. Further limitations um, of the applicability of the Convention are connected to types of operations listed by the Convention. So the operation should also fulfill some criteria. Firstly, it should be established by the organ of the United Nations, accordance to UN Charter. It must be conducted under United Nations control and authority. And thirdly, the operation must be either established for the purpose of maintaining or restoring international peace, 
And even if the part of the operation is involved in hostilities, doesn't doesn't work. So um, it's hard to grasp why civilian workers offering humanitarian aid should lose protection because one component of the mission involves participation of hostilities. Probably it's the reality. But the Secretary General proposed to improve this law and in 2005 uh, the optional protocol was adopted um, and the application of convention was a little bit extended also for the purpose of deliver delivering humanitarian assistance in peace building or delivering emergency humanitarian assistance. But there are no strict definitions of these, these situations. Another controversial point is that the protocol allows to state to make a declaration to Secretary General that it is not going to apply the provisions of the protocol um, with respect to an operation whose purpose is delivering emergency humanitarian assistance and which is conducted for the sole purpose of responding to a natural disaster. So natural disaster situation is quite different. Now in times of armed conflict, of course human rights law applies and additionally we have rules from international humanitarian law. Um, these provisions differentiate between international and non-international conflicts and between very, various categories of persons offering aid. In situation of international conflicts, we do have customary law for Geneva Conventions of 1949, first additional protocol of 1977, and these legal acts <coughs> define the category of relief action, humanitarian action, relief action, and specifies that relief action may be targeted only to protected persons, so civilians, wounded, shipwrecked, prisoners of war, and must be conducted in accordance with some principles. It must be humanitarian, impartial in character, conducted without any adverse distinction, and the consent of parties is demanded. Uh, the persons engaged in relief action have, of course, the general protection granted to, to them as civilians, if they are civilians, as long as they don't, do not take part in hostilities. Relief action typically also involves health care and religious assistance, but IHL treats this type of aid as a separate category and consequently more specific provisions apply to medical and religious personnel than to relief staff. Um, so under international humanitarian law, there are different categories. There is medical personnel, auxiliary personnel, hospital ship personnel, medical aircraft personnel, religious personnel, other relief personnel, including uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, National Red Cross Societies, other humanitarian and voluntary aid organizations, um, and um, rights, privileges, duties of states differ depending on in which categories, category you are. Um, of course, the medical staff should be respected and protected in all circumstances. This means firstly that they, shouldn't, that they should be spared, they shouldn't be attacked, and parties should take all feasible measures to, in order to ensure their protection. Um, it is also important um, to train armed forces um, in, in respect to international humanitarian law. Uh, but for example, why, why medical personnel are to be respected and protected always and everywhere, auxiliary personnel are only protected if they carry out medical duties at the time when they come into contact with the enemy or fall into, into hands. What um, strengthens this protection is, of course, um, the emblem of the Red Cross, Red Crescent or Red Crystal, 
And law also provides rules in which situations, which organization, institution can use this emblem, uh, because we believe it strengthens safety and security of humanitarian personnel. In conflicts of non-international nature, Article Number Three, that, in, that is included in all Geneva Conventions and the Second Protocol, Additional Protocol, are applied. Under these regulations, also in the cases of non-international armed conflict, medical and religious personnel are to be respected and protected. The definition of such personnel doesn't differ from that adopted with reference to international conflict. It is clearly stipulated that the personnel may not be punished for carrying out their duties and may only lose their protection in their capacity or medical or religious personnel if they act beyond the humanitarian duties and against rules of international humanitarian law. IHL makes no use of the terms relief personnel or humanitarian personnel in this case although it does use the notion of relief action. And in the end, I should add that um, we, should also, we can also find some, some provisions in international criminal law, especially I'd like to turn your attention to the Rome Statute, which established a separate category of war crimes directed at workers engaged in humanitarian work assistance. So, to sum up this short introduction, um, I'd like to say that um, there is no one consistent law concerning humanitarian action and protection and safety of humanitarian personnel. Um, this is one problem. And another problem is how this law is implemented, but we have... Um, all our speeches, discussion, to find the answer. So right now, let me invite uh, our keynote, keynote speaker, who will be Alejandro Pozo. Uh, he is the author of... Um, he will be presenting his recent work on attacks on medical missions. Uh, he is the author of publication on air strikes in Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen. So I can say enjoy, if it's possible. <laughs> so thanks uh, again for, for inviting MSF to this uh, very important conference. Let's see if I'm able to, 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 to talk about everything that I want to talk in maximum, maximum 30 minutes. I have a presentation is just for, for to facilitate that you follow uh, what I say. But please do not hesitate to interrupt me, raise your hands anytime, uh, ask for clarifications. Perhaps what I'm going to say is not that, that clear. Perhaps you need another example. Because you may disagree, you may say open. If this is uh, something short, we can do it uh, uh, right now. Otherwise, we will leave it uh, for for the discussion. Most of the things that I will say are in this uh, in this document. Not all. Um, I'll say half of the things that I will mention. This is a comparative analysis of what happened in Kunduz in Afghanistan. It's a hospital that was bombed. Two hundred forty-two people were killed. Another hospital in Yemen is in Abs, 19 people were killed in an attack. And then there's another hospital called Al Quds in Aleppo. This was not an MSF run, but an MSF supported uh, hospital uh, where, if I remember well, 54 people were, were, were killed. The idea of this is not to do a description of what happened because there are particular individual. Uh, reports, uh, internal reviews uh, about that, that they are public. I will uh, show you right now. But as well to try to get with uh, some conclusions uh, about the way wars are fought uh, today. So this is basically what I will what we'll mention. So there is an internal report on Kunduz. This is here on, on the left side. Another one on apps. 
is that one. All of them are available in PDF in, uh, in, uh, in internet. This is MSF version about what happened. And this is the, the last one on, on, on Aleppo. I think it's important when these kind of things happen to do a critical uh, uh, incident assessment and to put it, uh, uh, in the, I mean, to make it, make it public, the sooner uh, the better, because then you can, you can shape the narrative about what happened. You can force others to try to answer certain questions that you will put on, on, the, on, on the table. So this was basically your idea. So let's go into the, 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 the comments. So there are 10 points, and this is not everything about protection. Of course, I will not talk about protection of others. It's just about protection of ourselves, about uh, material workers. This is what the, the panel is about. Protection about others, this is much uh, uh, complex uh, and, uh, and interesting, I would say, issue. Just 10 points, not everything is here, but 10 points I think are worth mentioning. The first one is what determines uh, our protection, our security. Uh, you may have known that there are at least three different strategies uh, to ensure your security. The first one is acceptance, second one is protection, and third is deterrence. Acceptance is basically based on perceptions. And perception, uh, not only in our conflict, also here, depends on minimum three variables. First one is who you are. Second is what you do, and third is the way you do it. Depending on who you are, what you do, and the way you do it, you will be perceived in, a way, in one way or, or another. We, humanitarian workers, base our security in, in the acceptance strategy. There is a second strategy, which is uh, protection. It's basically to identify your vulnerabilities and to try to reduce those vulnerabilities. For instance, to have built walls, big walls, very, very thick, very high walls. But this may be in contradiction with the first strategy, because if people do, does, do not know what is happening inside, PHF is not going to help in the acceptance strategy. So PHF for the acceptance strategy, you prefer a fence. But a fence is not going to protect you from bullets. So sometimes there is a compromise. And the third one is the deterrence. Basically, is this, if something happened to me, then something will happen to you. This is basically the strategy used by the military. They also resort to protection, of course, and to acceptance, but mainly the deterrence. And for us, uh, humanitarian work is basically, if something happens to me, I will leave. And if I will leave, there will be a cost on you. Why? Because, for instance, your family will not be treated, or people will be angry with you. In practical terms, uh, it's very rare that we withdraw from, from different places. It's very difficult because actually what we want is to stay, to remain. This is just to say that basic, we base our security in the acceptance uh, component by far. And this depends very much on the perception of who you are, what you do, and the way you do it. That's why I come back to what I said yesterday. We need to separate ourselves from everybody else. We don't want to be associated to anybody else. Okay, so this is the first point I wanted to mention. The second is about direct engagement. Uh, we prefer to do it uh, directly, not to delegate this task to others, not to be OCHA, the UN, anybody else, the one negotiating or access to the different places. By engaging directly, you may understand what are the rules set by the the other side, by the interlocutor, by the parties to the conflict. As I said yesterday, IHL is very important, but uh, more than what IHL says, what it will determine our protection is what the different parties say. By directly engaging with them, you may understand some more things. In particular, we are, you are with uh, local people, or, I mean, you can understand and you can read it with lines. But this is sometimes very difficult. For instance, in the time of terrorism, to engage with certain actors is forbidden. I mean, you cannot really talk to certain people. And as you know, this, those lists of designated terrorist groups are always uh, growing and growing, so it's not that easy. On the other hand, perhaps they will not be willing to meet you, I mean, the top uh, leaders. Why? Because if uh, they may be afraid, then they may be targeted and killed. And here, when talking about engagement, what is key is to understand, or is to talk not to the cow, it's to the owner of the cow. 
sometimes we end up talking to the cow, but the cow cannot make decisions. But sometimes uh, the owner of the cow is not available for you. So this is always a challenge. That's why it's important to do analysis, to do a right actors mapping, to understand really who has the capacity to decide uh, and to impose their limitations. And then in, that, uh, in those meetings, you can set your red lines. For instance, in MSF, uh, we will always say that in hospitals, in medical centers, arms are not allowed, uh, military activity is not allowed, even in the surroundings, even in the compound. Uh, you cannot come in uniform, you cannot harass uh, patients, you can blah, blah, blah. And you may set that if this happened, this could be enough reason to leave. But again, we don't want to leave. So sometimes it's a, it's a bit difficult, but sometimes we, we do. This is what I said. Is, is it possible to set your own rules? At least you should try. But in many cases, it will not be possible. Some uh, actors are very, very tough, both the state and non-state actors. I'm just thinking right now in the Houthis or in uh, some opposition groups in, in Syria. It's not that easy to say, this is, this, those are my rules. But they will tell you, no, but this is my problem. So. <coughs> then I will highlight that the particularities of the national staff. National staff, of course, is also, uh, they are also humanitarian workers, and they are in certain places in a difficult position, meaning national staff is at the same time part of the organization, they are humanitarians, but as well they are part of that community suffering from the, from the crisis uh, and the big pressures and as well with a big, big emotional burden of what happened. So very often we think that um, that they will prioritize, I mean, I mean the, the, the professionalism before the rest, but probably not, none of you will do that. I just put some examples. You know that there are some key positions, for instance, the one who hires people or the one uh, who, who do the purchasing. I mean, those people that are in charge of the, of the money or, 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 taking, or making some decisions. Uh, perhaps in certain places, not a good idea that a local is having um, that position, because then you will put this person in a very, very difficult uh, position. Sometimes it's better to identify uh, those positions where uh, pressure may be too much, and it's okay. This, will be, this decision will be taken from the outside, it will be taken by international staff, um, because you know that national staff, uh, they have their families there, they may be started. I mean, it's not just pressure, you should do this as a commitment with all costs. It's uh, either you do this or your family will, will suffer from the consequences. So we, we could talk a lot about the, the, the national staff, but, um, but, um, but I think it's, it's, it's enough. Because another example of MSF, imagine that you are a surgeon and you have on the table of operations, you have a person, um, that belongs to a group that you identify as being the mother of your problems or the cause of your problems. And now you have to treat this person. Because you are very professional and you will do it, but you also have some, some colleagues. And those colleagues say, are you going to do this? Hmm? I, I, I can ask you as well. Uh, would you agree to treat uh, an Islamic State uh, terrorist uh, who has been the one that killed uh, hundreds of people here or there? So, no. So perhaps the bad options, okay, is there an alternative? So perhaps it could be some, somebody else doing that operation. A fourth point is to understand our vulnerability. The better we understand vulnerability, even if this is not the main strategy, as I said, is acceptance, but of course it can contribute to, 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 to a safer environment. For instance, in certain places, we know that, for instance, a person like me cannot move uh, freely in, let's say, in Kidal, in northern Mali. But perhaps uh, uh, another colleague uh, from the Sahel, uh, another international staff, but not with my face, not with my passport, he or she uh, could, uh, could move uh, here or, or there. So we are uh, doing, in many, many places, uh, profiling and saying, okay, who are people um, let's say, most uh, vulnerable to be kidnapped, to be attacked, or, or to be less accepted by local populations. For instance, to work with Ethiopians in, 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 in Somalia, perhaps it's not a good idea. Or, or. So the better you understand those kind of perceptions, 
the easier it may be. There are many, many more uh, issues about vulnerability and, uh, and protection, but let's, let's speed up about some other points. Number five uh, would be uh, identifying your, your, your locations, or I mean, uh, to be marked. If you are using vehicles, of course, you have the logo of the international organization, this may help. But first, you need to ensure that the different parties to the conflict understand what that logo means. For instance, uh, before uh, MSF, uh, the, the, the logo of MSF was not that one, it was kind of a, a red cross. So we were constantly identified as a Christian organization, and this was not a good idea in certain places. Actually, in some places, like in Yemen or Somalia, we did some research, and apparently, some people identify that this logo, this new logo, was Jesus Christ in, in, the, in the cross. So there is nothing you can uh, prevent, actually, from perceptions. Uh, uh, they are so plural that it's, it's hard to do. But first, you need to ensure that everybody understands that. Everybody understands what you are exactly doing in that place and what you are not doing in that place, and identify everything. We also provide uh, GPS coordinates to the parties to the conflict to ensure, in particular, to those parties to the conflict with uh, aerial capacity, uh, to ensure that they know where we are. And, but this is not that easy. Uh, why? Because perhaps you succeed in providing those GPS, but then you cannot control that those GPS will be finally recorded in the, in, in, in the flight, in the, in the plane. Actually, not all planes are let's say, uh, are able to, to have those, uh, those coordinates. And as well, you know that uh, special forces, uh, very often they don't do planify incursions. They decide on the spot. Uh, so if they decide on the spot, because they don't have those coordinates. And it's not just uh, five coordinates because MSF has uh, five hospitals. In, in one specific location, there may be hundreds of, of those non-target uh, uh, places. So this is not that easy. Answering... Uh, uh, a question of, of Bob, no? uh, of yesterday, he said, if you remember, that in, in Syria we were not sharing the GPS coordinates because we, had, we believe that it was counterproductive. I mean, if they know where we are, they will bomb us. Actually, we in MSA, we don't think that way. We prefer to share the, to share the coordinates, at least to say, okay, you were warned about that. This is, those, those are, this is about the rules. So we prefer to do that. On the other hand, we also think that in an hospital, a big one, with, let's say, thousands of patients coming every month, uh, the intelligence they know where the hospitals are, no matter if those are identified, in particular in, in, in Syria, right? when the Assad government of Russia, of course, they have this intelligence uh, capacity. The reason why in Syria we don't share the GPS coordinates, that this, this is right, we share the coordinates of MSF run hospitals, but not of MSF-supported hospitals. And the reason why is because medical staff of those MSF-supported hospitals, they prefer not to, because they really think they will be targeted by that. I'm not in a position to say if they are right or they are wrong, but we respect that, and this is the reason why we didn't share those, those, those coordinates. But again, this is a nightmare. It's constantly fighting and saying, I did send those coordinates to you, and then the interlocutor, because Saudi Arabia is saying, no, but I didn't receive it. I mean, this is not that easy, but by default we do it. Then we have the natural activities and the military activity to prevent hospitals, medical centers, and not to have military activity. Uh, I mean, when you have a functioning hospital, um, usually people accept uh, the thing, in particular the non-state actors. Why? Because you treat the families, so it's, uh, you are beneficial to them. But sometimes it's not that easy to, to, to ensure that there is no military activity, because sometimes you may be even in aware. We try first uh, not to have uh, weapons in, in the hospital. In certain places it's quite... Uh, uh, shocking to see that we have uh, in the entrance uh, a particular area where you can, like here, no? you, here you, you take your coat and you put it and you receive a receive. So imagine the same but with uh, a case. No? Or even, for instance, in Yemen with Jambiyas, with those uh, knives, uh, uh, long knives. You stay there. You cannot come with, uh, with uh, munitions. You cannot do uh, gatherings uh, there, even in the surroundings. Uh, in certain locations, for example, in Yemen, we even forbid, uh, uh, forbid the, the, the use of mobile phones, of cell phones, just to prevent the leadership uh, to, to, to continue. Yeah? Uh, 
giving orders from, from within the hospital and, and, and the like. Uh, I mean, this is not on the IHL. I mean, it's not even IHL, they allow uh, medical staff to carry uh, small guns that for own protection, but we prefer not to, basically, uh, for, to, to reinforce this acceptance component. We have nothing to hide, and we want everybody to know that we have nothing to hide, but again, this is not always uh, uh, that easy. Uh, then it's about uh, treatment as, as combatants. I mean, uh, this is less and less accepted. Uh, but I'm not just referring to, to locals, to the parties to the conflict. I'm also talking uh, about, about us, I mean, about the basis of support. I mean, uh, ordinary people living in, in Spain or in, in, in the UK. Uh, when I, I, I sometimes, uh, when, when I'm doing some, some sessions in, in, in uh, I, I play say, you know, okay, imagine, no? as I said with them before, Imagine that we are treating uh, the Islamic state fighters or Al Shabaab or the, the Taliban. You know, those are the devil, no? the, 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 the bad guys. And of course, we treat them. And it's true. Perhaps there is an injured combatant. This ceased to be combatant because an injured combatant is, is not a combatant anymore. But then you treat him, you treat him and then this person goes back to his, uh, to, to his uh, uh, war-related activity. Mm, so, wow, uh, this is what you do. No, this is not what we do. This is part of what we do. I mean, basically what we do is to treat uh, women and children. This is, this is the, the, the vast majority of the patients that we have. But, of course, in some places, we also treat combatants. We treat war wounded. And the closer you are, the closer you are to the front line, the, the more war wounded you, you, will, you will have. And, again, the parties to the conflict, they don't always accept this. When uh, Kunduz was uh, bombed, in you know, uh, Afghanistan, Afghan authorities, they were saying, of course, you were bombed. You were treating the terrorist. You were helping the terrorist. Then is the issue about the targeting clinics or special forces. You know that, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, it's all about the military advantage. When you can I mean, justify your actions by saying it was justified because it was a military advantage for that. I mean, yes, I have killed many people, but, but I killed that person who is a military commander, so I'm sorry for the rest, but it's justified. But we're talking about terrorism. I mean, the, the, just, the justification has become a bit broad. I see. Before, okay, you could justify a couple of, of civilian killing one uh, in caution, but today you can even justify 100 people uh, kill. Uh, uh, perhaps not publicly, but yes, in, in private. They said, yes, of course, we did that. Uh, and, for instance, in Yemen, uh, MSO was not targeted. But a person, it was a, form, a, a, a wounded combatant that came with a private car to the hospital. When he arrived to the hospital in the compound, then he was hit. And it happens that 18 more people, including children, they were killed as well. The argument by the Saudi Arabia, they said, we didn't know that this was an hospital. But my comment could be, or you could ask, or you could check first. No? Actually, you should check first, according to IHL. But this is an explanation that, uh, I mean, I want that guy, I will kill that guy, and I, I'm not going to, to, to waste my time just checking where this guy is located. What about the special forces? You know, the special forces are special operations. This means that they have, uh, let's say, more room to do certain things, more room to take decisions. Perhaps their actions will not be checked or double-checked by other people. They are under pressure to fulfill the mission. If they don't fulfill the mission, perhaps uh, this is not going to be that good for them in terms of our reputation. And as well, they have um, those operations are secret. And when operations are secret, you have your impunity assured. Nobody will... I mean, you will not be accountable to, to your actions. You have to do certain things. You do, and perhaps you even didn't planify. You are in, the, in your in your jet, and, and you saw something. You decide to conduct our operations, and perhaps you are not checking uh, what are you doing. So this is a, a problem in many places. In particular, when talking about the state uh, high forces. Then it's about labeling forces, uh, zones, and restrictions. Because you were. were uh, because you, you know uh, about this, but what, when Kunduz was attacked, Kunduz in, in Afghanistan, um, soon earlier, the U.S. declared Kunduz as a 
a full combatant zone. They said there are no civilians here. They are all combatants. Kunduz was at that time and still is the sixth, seventh city in Afghanistan. We are talking about more than 250,000, if I remember well, people living there. You cannot say that there are no civilian in a city, such a big city. At least you could consider us to be a civilians because you have those coordinates, you know we are here, but not very clear, okay, this is a hostile zone. And in an hostile zone, by definition, you don't need to ensure discrimination between civilians and combatants because if there are no civilians, so you don't need to discriminate. So this helps uh, indiscriminate uh, attacks. In Yemen, happened something similar. Not in this case of Abs, but in Sada. You know that Saudi Arabia declare, they declare a Sada governorate. A governorate is, is a region, a big region. This is a hostile zone. This is, uh, if you don't want to be hit, don't be here. We have been alerted that the way in many, many places. No, no, you cannot work here. No, this, is, this, is, this is a hot zone. If you are there, we are not responsible for what may happen to you. Because this is a hot zone. But it happens that in many, many, many places uh, that are declared hot zones, humanitarian needs are huge. Because perhaps there is not a, a capacity of reaction. This is a, 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 a particular acute uh, crisis where perhaps there is no response because this response, local response has been destroyed. Or perhaps there is not external response because, I mean, you, we NGOs, we are reluctant to work in certain locations. So in those places, at least we consider an MSF that our ad value may be very, very high. So we want to work there. But we are alerted that if you, are, if you get in this zone, then I, can, I will not be responsible for the consequences. So it's hard to work that way. And this is, I would say, increasing as well. In all, in all the different wars, you have certain zones that you are, should not be there. And finally, it's about impunity investigations, uh, about the utility of that. You know that there is uh, one particular one particular uh, commission that uh, is in charge of the terminate fact findings uh, um, about what happens. Uh, who is? She is. Here. You are part of, of that. Oh, this is very interesting. <laughs> so please. Um, this is the International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. Now, this is an instrument by, by the, uh, the Geneva Conventions. I think it's Protocol 1, 97, 91, or 90, 90, 90. So, um, in theory, when something happens, uh, you can ask them to, to, to do an investigation and, and, and to determine uh, what happened, uh, at least to certain f facts that happen. And they are, this is not a tribunal. They are not going to say who is guilty or they are not going to enter in that field, but at least they can set um, uh, the facts. What's the problem? This has almost uh, never been activated. I think the first time it was a petition on this commission to work, it was a kundus. Uh, even if this was activated in, I think, the protocol is from the 77, and it has been in... in in force, I think, since the early 90s. No? But the first time it was in Kunduz. But what happened? When you ask for these independent investigations, the parties, uh, uh, I mean, the state parties, they, uh, they must agree with that. And of course, Saudi Arabia, the US, Russia, those countries will not uh, agree to be independent investigated. What they will say, yes, I will conduct an independent investigation by myself. But of course, it's not independent. If you are the one that hit, and then the one that determine what happened. So, but in any case, uh, we have a problem with these kind of things. With the, the, with the, with the um, let's say, with the resolution of the UN, with the uh, in inquiry commissions, these kind of things. What, what, what I mean? It's, it's a problem of tempos. For us, what is important is we are working here. We want to remain working here. We are hit. We need to do something to be able to continue. But all those mechanisms are very slow. Maximum, if those mechanisms are useful, they will be useful for next war, not for this war. But what we want is to remain operational. 
So um, we are not very cooperative with all those instruments. As you know, MSF uh, do not uh, testify before the International Criminal Court. Just a few exceptions in the past, but not, not anymore. We are not part of uh, inquiries, independent investigations, and somehow you can say that we may even cooperate with impunity. But there is a reason for that. It's because if we cooperate with uh, those uh, mechanisms, we can not continue working in the places we are working, and this is our priority. So just to, uh, to comment this uh, protection, uh, the question is, does those mechanisms protect? Perhaps yes, in the long term, but uh, I mean, but we are all so interested in the present. Uh, uh, just one comment and a quick question. Uh, comment, um, yesterday we were talking about humanitarian principles as well. For us, yes, uh, as a humanitarian aid workers, acceptance is the best strategy, but to uh, an extent that we don't compromise on humanitarian uh, principle. One example from my country, uh, in Pakistan, you know that polio campaign was basically used to implement a political agenda. Uh, the target was achieved, but after that, it's like nine or 10 years now that uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, we have like polio present on ground. We cannot eradicate polio. Polio workers cannot go. Uh, you cannot have people on board uh, because they, they, they know they will be killed, the polio workers. A lot of workers have been killed, WHO workers have been killed. So I would say yes. Uh, and, and leading to that, a lot of organizations' registrations were revoked. Organizations are not allowed to work inside the two countries as well. So a small act of one organization by just compromising on neutrality and using the aid as, as a tool for uh, political agenda, uh, I mean, humanitarian sector has, uh, was really dented. But this is just a comment. And I think to, uh, to, to ensure protection of staff, protection of humanitarian workers, we also have to ensure that the organization doesn't compromise on humani humanitarian principle. Uh, one, one just question. I mean, you were talking about deconfliction or, or, or sharing of GPS coordinates. Uh, again, I would talk about Syria example. Inside Syria, in Aleppo and in Idlib, uh, we know hospitals were bombed. Uh, we know that UN convoys were bombed. Uh, we know that schools were bombed, knowing that they were deconflicted uh, and they were targeted. Uh, we cannot distribute, uh, we cannot do, do distribution because we know that if uh, there are people coming to distribution point, that is the, that is the target uh, for some of, one of the, 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 the partners to the conflict. Um, uh, you know, uh, in last two years or so, they have been sort of, you know, this uh, airstrikes with this term they use, double airstrike. What, I mean, double one of, yeah, what they do, that uh, they strike an area uh, and there are some casualties and then health workers or the humanitarian workers, they rush to the spot to do uh, humanitarian assistance and then there is another strike to kill those people, right? To, to tell them that you cannot support those people as well. And it was, it was very clear. So in this sort of situation, how would us, like for example, an organization who's working in that sort of scenario, it is easy to sort of, you know, share our, you know, uh, coordinates of our, our, of our office, of our assistance, of our distribution points. I mean, I... I Th thank you very much for your question. Yes. I just would like to announce that there will be some time for questions. So this is the exception, I Alejandro. It. Okay, it's, it's, uh, well, thanks for, for, for your comment. Um, Yes, it's, I mean, I, I, have a, I don't have an answer for your questions, of course, otherwise it's that really complex situations. But a couple of comments. Uh, I think it was a mistake that the CIA, when they killed, uh, CIA was, I don't remember, when they killed uh, Osama bin Laden in uh, Pakistan, they localized bin Laden by doing this fake uh, show of a Paulia campaign. So now it will be very difficult for militants there to think that those people doing polio campaigns, they are really independent, they're really neutral, and not looking for Osama Bin Laden too. So uh, when this happened, everybody was so happy, nobody criticized the decision, but yes, actions by the military, by political, uh, by the politics, may jeopardize uh, something. I'm not saying that the problem that you have mentioned is directly related to that, but this is one factor contributing for sure, and there are, there are many. Not like that. The problem is that this is seen as a political activity. And if this is seen, it is perceived that way, so you have a problem of acceptance. 
this is the point about the the, the Syrian issues. I mean, we have been bombing one year and some more month, 82 times, and most of them were in Syria. Uh, not MSF run uh, hospitals, but MSF supported. Actually, MSF run hospitals in Syria have not been bombed, supported, yes. What you can do, I mean, the uh, first thing is to prevent a military activity there. I think the reason why, one of the reasons, I'm not going to justify this at all, I think this is atrocity, but, uh, but um, of barbarism, but um, <clears throat> one of the reasons, you know, at least in Yemen, that hospitals uh, are not that much bomb in comparison with uh, schools is because, f first, because there are not that many hospitals remaining in, in, in place, but second is because uh, the Houthis, they gather for military activity in many schools. So the best thing we can do as a, as a, as a humanitarian workers is to prevent this from happening. If you are running a school, if you're running a hospital, uh, you should set your limits and say, no, this is not acceptable uh, here um, because uh, you are putting at risk your own life um, doing that. But this is not that, uh, that easy. Uh, but of course, this should be a kind of recondition. Um, not only to prevent military activity, it's everybody to perceive that there is not military activity there. Uh, because what matters is not reality, it's the perception of reality. It's what is in other minds. And this is very difficult to know. So we need to do this. Having said this, uh, uh, just to conclude, I would like just to, to, to end with... Uh, last last with one minute, please. Yes, uh, it's, it's enough. Um, you know that IHL is so clear. It's at the mine, and uh, we, are, we expect that, uh, that uh, parties to the conflict, they respect IHL. In particular, those big states that um, they, 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 they say, uh, I mean, they are the, the, the guarantors of IHL. But you know that uh, everything is ready to interpretation. I would like to show you some reps from the Laws of War manual by the United States. This is the way they interpret certain IHL uh, comments. This is verbatim. I just copy and paste. This is PDF uh, available in internet. Again, the Laws of uh, the manual of no the Laws of War manual by the U.S. They said. If a commander determines blah, 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 then deprecation would not be visible and would not be required. Meaning is, uh, I will try to be, to, to be conscious, no? Just to take it, those precautions measures. But if I cannot, I don't do it. But IHL says, you have to do it. But uh, no, I will not do it. I can, I will do it. Second, what about military advantage? I know that there is a military advantage. I don't need to be accountable because it is confidential. It justifies, full point. I'm not sure this is the way IHL works. What about starvation? We know that the starvation is, uh, is uh, according to IHL, I mean, it may be allowed here or there, but we have no with this wording. What about the last sentence? Destroying a supply route that is used to move military supplies, but is also used to supply the civilian population with food. Population, civilians, they need food to eat and to survive. But uh, as this may also fit the combatants, if I attack those supply lines, this may justify. I'm not sure that this is 100% in line with IHL, uh, the way we study at the universities. What about personnel, uh, supplies, and equipment? I mean, if we have enough reasons to block, we block. Again, I'm not talking about the Islamic State, I'm not talking about Sudan, I'm talking about the US. And of course, this is not the only case. I know that France, I know that uh, the Russia, they have similar manuals. Then, what about uh, interpretation? It will be us interpreting, it will not be ICRC. We know that, I, I, is, uh, I mean, this is legitimate. I mean, uh, that all the states, they would know, I will do my own interpretation, but they do so openly. Uh, they say so openly, they say, no, it will be myself saying yes or not. And finally, what, uh, I mean, they can not authorize you to be in certain places, and they justify this because of your own safety. So thank you about that. Those are just some reps. You have this uh, many more in, in that uh, um, document and with the interpretation that uh, I did uh, about those things. But the point is, do we really believe in uh, IHL? Not only in practice, but also in in, in theory, this is the point.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, for this outstanding speech and all your advices. I noted uh, a lot. Take care, care for your acceptance and perception. Set red lines. Remember, national staff situation is especially sensitive. Understand vulnerability. Use logo with a sense. Special forces can be special challenge. And don't expect too much from investigative mechanisms. And thank you for showing us this gap between IHL and, and practice. And now I would like to start um, our panel discussion. Um, probably at the beginning, please, uh, in few sentences, introduce your organization's most important uh, actions, your experience. Can I start with you, Jackson? Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Jackson Mungoni. I'm the head of mission for PIH in South Sudan. Um, PIH in South Sudan is implementing food security and livelihood programs, and also we are implementing an emergency wash, sorry, and also emergency shelter and NFIs in South Sudan. Most of our locations where we work are quite remote locations, which have uh, um, less infrastructure, very inaccessible, um, where there is no communication. So you'd find that. Uh, it's a challenge for us to really ensure the safety of our staff when they're in the field. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Robert. Thank you. Um, so my name is Bob Gossen and I currently work for the Belgium Red Cross, but I'm here as, you know, on personal capacity, as I said yesterday. Uh, I've been working with different organizations, including the ICRC, for a long time in the field. Uh, and I'm very interested in the issue of security of humanitarian workers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alejandro, would you like to add something about your organization? Uh, let me say, uh, as I said yesterday, is, I mean, it's not only that, uh, I mean, working in a conflict situation, in emergencies, um, uh, this is not only what we do, uh, but uh, well, we are known by, by, by doing that, because it's uh, where we add value. Um, are and we are yes we are finding more and more difficulties. Uh, I'm not very very sure that um, today is more dangerous to be a, a humanitarian actor in general, but I do know that in certain places, mainly in those war on terror related scenarios, yes I think definitely is more complicated today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. And my first question, which I have for everybody of you, uh, could you please share? experiences of your organizations with safety and protection uh, and what's your organization's policy to protect humanitarian workers to increase uh, their safety um, especially uh, to Robert uh, could you could you please say to what extent uh, emblems are protective emblems uh, to, to which uh, to what extent um, all these principles uh, which you follow contribute to safety of, of the personnel. So maybe you could you could start, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first, I, I don't think it's a yes or no uh, question. Uh, and if it was, the answer would would certainly not be yes. Uh, so no, it's not enough to have an emblem to be protected or to be safe. Of course, it doesn't mean that the emblem doesn't serve any purpose. Um, Essentially, and again, I'm talking on personal capacity, the emblem is actually to inform everyone, and GPS coordinates are the same, because now, these days, weapons don't actually work on what you see, that this is a Red Cross, Red Crescent location, or this is an MSF location, or this is a PH location. <coughs> now, the question becomes, what do you do with this information? Is this enough for you not to target it? Or is this a reason to target it? Or maybe it happened by not willingly. You were actually you had something else in mind, and then we can discuss what this something else is. Um, for me, the important point here is more, I mean, we're looking at practitioners who will go in the field. Some of them are already in. I think the theory of it and IHL is very important, and, and it's important to understand what is at stake. But it's also important to understand the dynamic of the situation you are in. I said it yesterday and we repeat it today. I think the main 
protection for humanitarian workers is actually to listen, to understand what is happening. As we said yesterday, you know, saying I'm here because IHL allows me to be here and IHL protects me and makes me safe. Sorry, but this is stupid. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's stupid. It's not exactly the same thing. You have to understand where you are and what is happening, what is at stake, and then you have to decide how to stay safe. I can give an example because I know you. this is what you were hinting at. And again, I'm not talking on behalf of any organization. I can tell you when I was in Iraq and we were probably the only organization or the very few, let's say, organization with international presence in Iraq at the time, southern Iraq, I mean, not, not Kurdistan, with no armed protection, and that was in 2009. Uh, for me, we were there before. I mean, the, that was the ICRC. My main job as head of the office in Najaf was to make sure that five interlocutors, and I was very lucky because I only had five, with weapons, knew who to call and were happy with us. This was security for me. Security was that these five guys had to know two things. First, if they have a problem, they don't need to shoot at us. They don't need to bomb us. Just call. We'll fix it. And yes, I will answer the phone. It seems very simple, but actually, Alessandro hinted at this also. He said it's deterrence, and he's right. Our deterrence, if we are in a mindset where our deterrence is, if you hurt us, we leave, and I know how difficult it is to leave. Let's reverse that logic for a second. What does it mean? If you want me to leave, what would you do? So let's be careful on how we, and again, I don't have solutions, but I'm giving you just an example. And someone mentioned Grozny, I think you mentioned Grozny at one point for the ICRC, the awful killing of the six delegates of the ICRC in Grozny. The only reason why I can speak about it very openly is because actually, for very interesting reasons, but it's a different conversation. There's a very complete Wikipedia entry on this assassination, actually, which, because it's confidential. And essentially, the Grozny message was, we don't want you here. We, and I take responsibility, I wasn't there, ICRC, <coughs> didn't listen. Now we can discuss why and how. It ended up by a message loud and clear, bloody, awful, and then we listened. There are other places where the th same thing happened. I mentioned yesterday Baghdad because it's very open. I, again, I don't want to get into more touchy confidential issues, but Baghdad was very, was very clear also in 2003. The Canal Hotel was bombed. Uh, Professor Bragg mentioned that, and that was a watershed moment for all of us humanitarians. One week later, the ICRC delegation was bombed. Again. What happened during this week? Were we listening? Now, to be very fair on the ACRC also, the ACRC delegation was bombed before opening hours. And it's not by mistake. I think the message was there also. So my point is, listen, understand what's happening. And the more people have weapons and power, the more the way they think and their priorities are important. And there is something I've been hearing for two days and I personally disagree with, which is to say, this is politics. We shouldn't get involved in that. Of course, we should not take political position, political stance, but we should understand what's happening. If you don't understand what's happening today in a conflict zone, or even in a non-conflict zone, if you don't understand how Liberia operates, there is no way for you to stop Ebola. It just won't work. You're just being ridiculous. You should go back home and, bring, and be replaced by someone else. So, it's very important to understand how it works. And there's a very, very big difference between understanding and approving. I don't approve how these groups work. I hate the way they work. In my world, they should all be brought to justice. That doesn't mean I will not take time and energy to understand how they operate. Because at the end of the day, our security and more importantly, the, the programs we're implementing are linked to that. So going back to the practical example, I had these five interlocutors. And my job was to make sure that they were happy with us. And that requires two things. First, as I said, our capacity to listen and to really take on board some criticism. Yeah, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not right, but they have weapons. So the balance of what's right, what's not right is a little bit tilted or very tilted. So first, really listening to what's happening and see how we can accommodate that. 
And that is linked to the principles, and we can get into this uh, if, if you want. And the second one was to make sure they know how we operate. There is this word I learned, and Swiss people love it. It's predictability. We had to be not 100%, 400% predictable. Like they would know beforehand exactly what we would do if this happens. What would happen if there's an attack in Najaf? What would happen if the Americans strike you know, a civilian location? What would we do? Shall we go on the media saying this is unacceptable? Yes, no. This is not something you want to discover when tempers are high and everyone is under stress. This is something you want to know beforehand. It's like, listen, this is who we are. This is what we do. And we will continue to do it. Predictability is very boring in your personal life. Don't be predictable, please. But predictability is probably life-saving in the field. People need to know exactly what you will do in these situations. In, in which case, the rule of the game is clearer. And it's very difficult to maintain that. So a long answer to a short question. Sorry. Thank you very much. So nothing can replace the knowledge and understanding. And thank you for showing us this value of predictability. Um, Jackson Mungoni, could you, could you continue? Maybe you reveal us any secrets, how you are prepared before going to the field. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you very much. As I highlighted to you before, um, in South Sudan, it's quite difficult to predict what is going to happen. Um, but you know, we are part of uh, the NGO of uh, security uh, working group. So there's a lot of coordination that happens there. So we gather a lot of information before we send our teams to the field. We do security risk assessments. But sometimes it's very difficult, especially if you are sending teams to a location where we haven't uh, sent them before and where we also we don't have contacts. So sometimes it's quite difficult. I can tell you that you know, during this year, we have had three evacuations of our staff from the field. Uh, the first one was when the team had gone out in an intercluster rapid response mission. They finished the distributions. After finishing the distributions, the other communities around, they came and attacked you know, the beneficiaries because they wanted to get the items from the beneficiaries. But the main problem that happened was that where you say listen. Our teams were listening to the communities to the local partners who are on the ground. And there were, there were a, lot, a lot of shooting going on, but the partners on the ground, because they are used to those kinds of uh, joyful shootings, they said, this is just joyful shooting, nothing's going to happen. And it went on for about 30 minutes, an hour, until later, the team saw that, you know, these people have already started burning houses in another location, very close to where they were, and they were not prepared to run out. Uh, but uh, fortunately, they managed to run out. But they had to leave, uh, you know, some of their provisions in that particular location, and they have to be, uh, you know, evacuated the following morning. And then recently also, we had to do two evacuations in one and a half uh, months in a location where our teams uh, had a static presence. But also, at least for the teams, they managed to listen, as you say, and uh, they listened uh, to both sides. Uh, in that particular location, you would find that uh, there are different uh, sort of governments in the location. There are about three uh, 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 governments in that particular location, but our team said contacts with all of them, and they were even sharing information from the different locations with our teams. So I think that one is about acceptance, because, you know, uh, the three governments there, they accepted our teams in that particular location. So we managed to evacuate them. But also, there was a case in another location for a different organization altogether where they listened. But, uh, you know, this was more like noise uh, because uh, the armed forces in that particular location, they wanted to, to loot the compound. There was no, like, armed conflict coming. So the NGOs, they listened and they moved out. Then immediately there was looting in the compound, no fighting at all. So, you know, those things happen. Uh, but uh, just to tell you also what we normally do, we always try to make sure that, you know, our staff are quite secure away. Um, and we do like re regular trainings for our staff. Uh, we have uh, security operating procedures. And, uh, but also we make sure that when they're going to the field, they go there with uh, enough communication equipment. As I indicated before, 
in most of the locations where we work, there is no like telephone network. Yes, it was there before, but you know, the people now who are in charge of those particular locations, they disconnected the network because they don't want people to communicate out um, about what is happening in their locations. So yes, we equip them with like, uh, you know, satellite phones, but also going to the field, it's always difficult, you know, to carry these equipments uh, because uh, there's quite a long process. You can get clearance, yes, maybe from the government uh, to take the equipment there, but when you get there, again, you are subjected to a lot of questions while you are carrying that. But also when our teams carry like money to the field, because it's difficult to, trans uh, to transport money to non-government controlled areas, when they reach there, sometimes they are asked again how much money they have, which again puts them at risk when they are in the field. But uh, yes, of now, you know, we haven't had in any security incidents about, uh, you know, looting of money from, the, uh, from our staff. So it's quite a challenging environment. Uh, but uh, I think we've managed to, uh, to implement our activities because of our acceptance. And uh, also when our teams get there, they make sure that you know, they meet all the concerned you know, local authorities to share with them what they're there for, and also you know, our criteria for targeting of our beneficiaries and how we are going to implement our activities in the locations. And after finishing the activities, we also debrief them. How did you see it? Uh, and also they give us feedback. And uh, for your information, we have received a a few bits of uh, letters from you know, local authorities in non-government controlled areas saying that we are very happy about how we have been implementing the activities here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Alejandro, please. Okay, uh, remember when I started in, in MSF that it, it was not a writing rule, but we often said that what was not allowed or what, not, what was not acceptable in MSF was uh, uh, in, in, uh, staff to be killed, to be kidnapped, or to be raped. Uh, unfortunately, today we, we don't talk anymore in that, uh, in, in that line because it's, it's not possible. I mean, you, you decide to work in certain places, inherently this risk will exist, of course. We'll try our best not, not to happen, and when this happens, it's a, really a tragedy in the organization, but this may, may happen. So the first thing that we do is to accept that this may happen. Um, as well, when something, if for instance, if one person is killed, the question is why as well. Because if this person has been killed just because of criminality, uh, the organization was not targeted, this is not political, we may continue operations. Uh, even if this is very hard uh, for us, we will continue uh, operations. But it's very important to read if this incident was political, as uh, Bob was saying. Um, I mean, do, we, do, we, do you want us to leave? Uh, but probably they will not tell you uh, straight. No? They will say, I want you to leave. But uh, because they will, they will warn you in a different way. So it's important to read the things because otherwise uh, the second time you will be attacked, it will be worse, and the third one will be much worse. No? This is the way it works. With regard to protection, we are very, very, very reluctant to use armed protections. We are uh, practically never um, going armed convoys, but, uh, but military. Um, and we almost never uh, use, uh, uh, we hire the, 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 say the, the services of a private security company, with this, this kind of things. This is very, very rare, but this has happened as well. And sometimes this has happened because of imposition of the authorities. They say, if, uh, this is the only way you can operate here. So uh, you are forced to that. And in certain very, very uh, occasional uh, moments, we have uh, decided to do it. It was a, a, an option. But with the exception of, of Somalia permanently and Chechnya for some time, this has been extremely rare for MSF. But I think this is on the rise in general in terms. I mean, uh, um, and the one thing that uh, one comment on politics. No, I think everything is political, and uh, when we do humanitarian action, even, even hunger. Hunger is not a technical problem of not having enough food. I mean, because in any famine, there are people that cannot eat, and there are people that eat a lot, uh, and this is about power, access to. Uh, to food. So everything is political. We need to understand those things. Uh, of course, one needs to take position and understand. Another thing is to be uh, unaware about uh, the, the, the reasons for the crisis. We need to understand why crisis happen. And the last thing then to mention is, is about some practicalities. It's something important to have uh, um, direct access to those people, direct and immediate access to those people able to stop attacks. 
it's a, a bit surrealistic, but uh, when you have a, a satellite a satellite phone of, of an organization sometimes you go to the to the list of contacts and you have a world or one world or two or three commander one one or two one or three but this is important and it's important to ensure that you have some what is called hotlines uh, i mean that when things happen you may call somebody and say we are here so can you please stop and sometimes a bit surrealistic but this has worked Sometimes they have stopped fighting because you were there with the additional no, value of protecting others as well. No? Just, just looking to protect yourself, you may also protect others. But again, sometimes it has not worked. When Kunduz was bombed, it was not only one strike. It was five strikes in one hour and 15 minutes. We immediately called Afghan authorities, NATO authorities, US authorities in Afghanistan, people in Tampa, in, uh, in Florida, in, in, in the US, people in Washington. We had all those numbers, and we followed everybody. But it still continued for over an hour, striking the very same hospital. Why? This is a bit complex. I know the places, for instance, in Yemen, it happens that we have a lines, but you may also call, um, perhaps nobody is in picking up uh, the phone. It may happen, but you should ensure that you have those numbers. Because, I mean, and this is something, I would say, quite practical. Yes. Thank you very much. Questions. I can see some yeah. questions. So let's um, gather maybe three questions, answers, three questions, answers. Okay, you will. Um, sorry, I don't want to derail everything and get stuck into Kundas. <laughs> um, but there's a number of us, I think, in the room today, and we're having a series of lectures with a visiting American colonel about war crimes. And coming up in the following weeks, I think we've got one of the investigating officers for Kunduz coming to talk to us. And so it's really interesting, maybe if you could give us some questions that we should ask for that lecture, but some questions for you. Uh, maybe, you know, do you believe it was an accident, as the Americans claim, or do you think it was deliberate? I don't want to put you on the, hot, hot, on the spot here. I know it's kind of maybe a difficult question. And, uh, you know, can you trust military investigations? And if not, you know, what does that do for the whole system of accountability? You know, if you can't have some measure of trust there. Um, if you don't want to answer those questions, uh, you talked a lot about um, individual organizations making their own rules and doing their own thing. Uh, do you think operational independence is important for different organizations for protection? Again, can you repeat the last question? Sure, sure. Sorry. So do you think operational independence is important for different organizations? The fact that MSF does one thing, ICRC maybe takes a different approach. Do you think that independence is important? Or do you think there are any areas that the sector as a whole should work better together to improve our collective protection? Uh, you can pick and choose from those questions if you prefer. Give the microphone to Elżbieta Mikoskuza, to Dr. Elżbieta, please. Thank you so much. As you mentioned, <laughs> fact-finding commission, of course, I, I felt invited to take the floor. But before that, sorry, as I'm an IHL person, just uh, uh, before that one comment on, on this gap between uh, law and reality uh, that was mentioned yesterday and is mentioned uh, also today. Uh, as for mini military uh, US manual, yes, uh, just a few comments. Uh, sometimes what we find there and we find in many other internal regulations is indeed blunt violation of IHL, yes, and then it means that states simply uh, completely don't respect what they have accepted. But sometimes uh, this violation is not that uh, obvious um, because, for instance, the state is not obliged to respect some rules because it has not accepted them. And uh, uh, for instance, with uh, starvation. Starvation is uh, the obligation that is contained in protocols additional, and the United States are simply not party to those documents. Um, uh, it is criminalized under uh, ICC statute, the statute of the International Criminal Court, but the United States are not party to the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, what is interesting, even in the sta even for those states that are parties to, to, to the ICC statute, uh, starvation is criminalized only in international armed conflicts. The part on war crimes committed in non-international armed conflicts does not contain starvation. Yes, so, so for us it's obvious, I mean humanitarians, for us starvation is absolutely prohibited, it's, it's you know, they, uh, but, but it is not the case. What is 
Indeed, for me, most striking in, your, uh, in, in those quotations that were shown to us is the statement that the uh, uh, USA has not accepted the study on customary law. Because actually, I'm old enough to remember that they accepted it. I mean, there was the official letter by, by the um, first legal advisor of the Condoleezza Rice at the time, yes, John Belligerent III, sent to the International Committee of the Red Cross after the study was published, that a 39 pages long letter, which is I mean, available huh, publicly. Um, uh, so, so, so stay, uh, I mean, opposing to some findings of the study, but accepting the study in general. Yes. Yeah? So, so, so there are some, of course. But what I would like to mention that the, uh, I mean, the, the, this manual is really widely criticized all over the world, including the United States. There was the special. Uh, the special meeting of the American Society of International Law in order to discuss it in very critical terms. I understand that for you, the meeting of the American Society of International Law doesn't mean much, but it is composed not only of IHL lawyers, but of very influential polit politicians as well. So we may hope, as, as this document was prepared pretty recently, that slowly, slowly, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the, the the critical opinion will prevail and it will be changed, yes, in those parts that are in, in contradiction to, to U.S. obligations. Huh? Um, and with this slowly, slowly, we can, like yesterday you repeated several times, we, we have to continue trying, yes, we cannot just say, okay, it's violated and we do nothing. Uh, an example is the fact-finding commission, yes, as you absolutely rightly said. It was established under document from 1977. In practice, in the 1990s. For many years, I mean, I, I have not been a member since its inception. Uh, it, it, I became a member only later. But still, we were trying very hard to get a mission. We were very often close to having a mission, almost sitting on our suitcases going to Colombia, to Iraq, to Gaza Strip, uh, but at the very last moment being rejected by one of the parties to the conflict. Um, there were some attempts <laughs> earlier, uh, for instance by Human Rights Watch, who uh, made public appeals, uh, particularly in the context of, of some accusations uh, during the Iraq conflict, uh, conflict in Iraq, uh, that the commission would be, would be um, employed, which uh, never met with a positive answer. And then this most powerful appeal by Médecins Sans Frontières two years ago with, with the Kunduz affair, uh, which made the commission very widely known. Uh, again, it was not accepted. But I think there were two direct, very, uh, one direct and one indirect, very positive results of your appeal. I mean, we could not be accepted because it's not the organization that activates the commission. It, 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 it can be activated only by states, yes? And then, as, as you mentioned, states were not interested in activating us. But I think that the report that uh, Thomas mentioned uh, uh, that was prepared by Pentagon after this would not be that diligent, that long, that uh, full of details if there was no appeal, I, I mean, if it was not prepared after the rejection of the fact-finding commission, yes? So, so they had to prove uh, that, because even within NATO, there was a very strong um, uh, pressure on the United States to accept the fact-finding commission because of your very strong position. Yes, so the, the United States had to take it seriously. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether all the findings were correct, so mm, uh, I have my own opinion. But but, um, but at least they had to prepare a report and to, to, to make it public, yeah? So, so, so this was a direct uh, effect. An indirect one, but I have to mention it, that finally, this year, 2017, the Commission undertook its first mission with the approval of states, including the United States that have not accepted our commission. Um, because of, so I think that slowly, slowly, when we try, when we do, it was the mission, uh, if you go to the website, uh, uh, you will find more details, at the invitation of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe because of some events that took place in 
uh, in Eastern Ukraine. So, 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 and but I think that without this earlier pressure by Human Rights Watch, by Médecins Sans Frontières, by many states who are friends of the Commission, uh, this today's, uh, I mean, this year's mission would not be possible. So. So be cynical, <laughs> don't be cynical, uh, criticize, but despite, despite criticizing, let's try, let's continue, because it brings results. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and please microphone for the professor. I just want to mention that every conversation I've been involved in involving protection of aid workers is always about the physical attacks on aid workers. I just want to encourage you as students and as researchers in humanitarian affairs to broaden it to all areas of protection of aid workers, including health protection. As a former senior manager of a humanitarian organization, I can tell you that amongst my staff, I have to deal with many fold, t many times more the number of staff who had lifetime debilitation from health situations, mental health and physical health, from being out in the field and working in the field, than from casualties from armed attacks. So the duty of care of organizations is not just making sure that you have your sat phone when you go out to South Sudan. The duty of care of organizations extends to having to cover all aspects of your physical health and mental health when you are in, in the field. And it is a serious, serious issue, much, much more than in, in, term, in, in terms of the actual uh, impact in terms of lifetime debilitation, disabilities, casualties, <coughs> many times more uh, from non-physical attack incidents. Thank you very much. So let, uh, let, um, let our guests to comment, answers, questions, and then the microphone will go to the second part of the room. Alejandro, would you like to start? Yes, uh, yes. A couple of, of, of comments on, on, on you and as well on, on, the, on these laws of War Manuel. I have to say that, uh, as far as I understand, this, uh, this document was leaked, and that's why they decide in a given moment to make it public. I mean, some of those uh, manuals are available, not publicly available, but you can ask and you can check, but many others, they are not. But uh, I guess that this is not something new. Before, the US, they also had some manuals, uh, but uh, we were unaware about the contents of these uh, uh, some people. But today, it's public, and again, I encourage you to read it, because you learn a lot about the way I were conducted. Again, I'm not just focusing on the U.S. because I have uh, anti-U.S. Uh, feelings or nothing like that. It's, if the U.S. is behaving that way, you can imagine how others may do. You know that the U.S. Uh, also they settle doctrine, military doctrine, no? but I mean, it's, it's the, the, the image no? where other people, other, other states wants to, re, uh, uh, want, want to mirror no? the way. On the particular question, if I remember well, it's about it was a, a mistake. Second, about accountability, reporting, these kind of things, and then independence of does it work. Uh, starting by the accountability, I mean, the US, uh, they did uh, a public release of what happened in Kunduz. They released about 600 pages out of 3,000. What we know in MSF is those 600 pages is the same that you can find in internet. What is in the 2,400 remaining pages, we don't know. Most of the things I have said about that incident are in those 600 pages. Like, this was an hostile zone, no civilian remaining, uh, blah, blah, blah. And this is quite sensitive. So you can imagine what is in the 2,400 pages. Uh, I don't know. But at least the US, first, they acknowledge attack. Second, uh, they did an investigation. And third, they released a passion of the investigation. Or experience in Syria is not, not even recognition. <laughs> not even recognition. So at least we have that, and you can play, and you can engage, you can, you can talk, you can prevent uh, further attacks, you can do a lot of things if you have this, this willingness. But again, in many places, you don't even have the recognition. Not only in, in Syria, in Sudan, in many places, this not, not happened. About a mistake, I forgot to mention the last line. The last line is, okay, it's a mistake, it's a collateral damage, it's a deliberate attack, is it a, 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 an act of negligence, so what, what, what is that? Of course, you need a lot of info, you need to ensure 
you know what is in the mind of the person that press the button. Uh, and this is not feasible for, for us. So the first question is, I have no idea. Uh, five strikes in one hour in the very same uh, building using the smart bombs, guided uh, uh, bombs. This, I mean, the hospital was this size. The main building in the hospital was this one. It was struck five times. The rest, it was untouched. Um, according to the US themselves, they received, uh, uh, I mean, they, they didn't have ground forces. They were the Afghan ground forces, the, the ones that requested the US Air Force to bomb there. Did they lie? Did they do it in the purpose? No idea either. The Afghanistan, they didn't do this, this investigation, of course. There's nothing public on that. The same may happen in other places. In Saudi Arabia as well, there were guided bombs, smart bombs, bombing here and there. And actually, they hit the internet objectives. Uh, uh, was MSF touched it? I don't, we don't think so, because uh, if we are touched it, we have to leave. So I don't know. What I know is that minimum, 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 this is an act of negligence. You are obliged by international law, by domestic law, by many different laws, uh, to verify, to take some precautions, uh, to, to be proportional, uh, to blah, 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 all those kind of things. And they didn't do it. So minimum is an act of negligence. In domestic law, here, if you commit an act of negligence and you kill 32 people, you will be uh, before a tribunal and you will pay for that. I'm not talking about economic pay. Uh -huh. You have to pay for that. But in international relations, no. No, I'm sorry, that's it. So before we had this rhetoric of collateral damage. Now, you know, Kosovo, Iraq. Now we have this rhetoric of mistake. And both are not acceptable. I mean, you cannot be satisfied to say, okay, I'm sorry, yes, uh, the 42 people killed, including 14 of your colleagues. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, we didn't want to, uh, that's it. No? You know, Obama has called you, no? you know, Obama called him as a president. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. We will compensate, we will pay some money. Is that enough? No, no, it's not enough. Something else. But you know that impunity, which is my personal opinion, is not MSF, is uh, one characteristic, or, or not only in wars, but in international relations. What is important for you to fulfill domestically is not important outside. And finally, about independence, is that important? I, I think yes. And I will put an extreme example. It's not only important that MSF differentiates or separates from ICRC, even if, if, if we uh, love ICRC. No? I mean, we always say that we have a kind of. A, of of our brothers, these kind of things. No? Not only ICRC, the UN, anybody else, we, of, we often differentiate internally in MSF, and this works. For instance, in Yemen. In Yemen, we have four different sections operated in Yemen, doing four different engagements with the Houthis. Is that important? Yes. Because if one section is expelled, the rest may remain. It's important for you to pressure here, to pressure there, just to, 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 to get some independence uh, when doing actions, but as well it's important for the other side. I mean, the Houthis, they don't want us to leave, but they also want to impose their, 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 their will here or there. So it's okay, you will leave, but you stay, so you are different organizations, you may also play with that. For instance, in Sudan. In Sudan, after the International Criminal Court in Dakmin uh, against uh, al-Bashir, uh, uh, two sections of MSF were expelled. We were accused of providing information to the ICC, ICC uh, which, uh, of course, was not true. But perceptions, so they were expelled. In Sudan, uh, they said, you know, the real MSF, the good ones, are the Spanish ones. Uh, there's no problem with them. You can operate. But you French, you uh, Dutch, of course not, or whatever. OK, it works. Finally, what we want is to operate in one place. So we also play. The same for Ethiopia, the same for any place. Then, if this works at an internal level, even dividing MSA in different sections, you can imagine the way it works, uh, whatever. Think that usually, I mean, this is, is, is about personal relations. Sometimes it's about the mood or the, or the pe person in charge in one particular. And perhaps they like you. They, they like you because of you, because you are a funny guy and this kind of thing. And I don't like this person, whatever. Again, it's about who you are, what you do, the way you do it. This is about those kind of things. So it's important not to, not to, to have some freedom as well of movements and those kind of things. So my question is, my answer is yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Robert, please. Thank you. Um, uh, I will start with when, where, where Alessandro finished. Uh, I think, yes, at least, sorry, I don't want to be cynical, but to be realistic, if we are hit, if we are targeted, at least I would rather have this happening because of us, not because of the other guy. Because at the end of the day, this is the question. 
So yes, it's important to be independent, but then it's very, very important not to conclude out of independence that we are better than the other guys. No, we're not better. We are just who we are, as you said. And then the second point, which is very important, we look at it, this is not a spectator sport. Uh, sorry, it's a bit of a US expression, but it's not something you watch on TV especially us practitioners. So it's not like, yeah, well, the Americans were striking in Kunduz, that's not good, they're not good, the Americans are not good, MSF are the nice guys, I'm rooting for MSF, yeah, they're nice, and the others, ah, no, but actually they're helping terrorists, they're not the nice guy. Okay, this is my mother's conversation. Please don't tell her I said that. <laughs> now, we have to go deeper into this, and the personal contact is actually the key to access. I can tell you from a lot of organizations I've worked in, very often we lose contacts, exactly the numbers you were referring to, just because we've changed head of mission. Yeah. Don't forget to see, and not only see, but also seek, for the human person behind the uniform. Yes, they are Houthis or they are Syrian regime, and yes, in my world, most of them should be in prison. And none of them should be in position to influence others' life, okay. But we don't live in my world, we live, we live in the real world. So behind the uniform, behind the abuse, there is a person and you have to reach out that, to that person. If not, you won't be able to do anything. And then it becomes a personal contact. And building on the issue of the phone, the phone numbers, yes, you have to have these phone numbers. Yes, you have to have communication means so you can call. A very stupid thing. Satellite phones don't work inside. If you don't have an antenna, yeah, your whatever, $2,000 now to Raya is useless if you're getting bombed and you're inside. Because you're not going to go outside and wait for the network for 10 minutes. Very stupid. Life-saving. Okay, going back to the, phone, to the phone numbers. This is also the personal thing. So the first phone call to the Houthi commander, or in my case, to the Iraqi militia commander. Do you really want this first phone call to be stop shooting at me? Probably not. So you want to call them more often so they pick up the phone. And we all know that from our personal life. If you want people to pick up the phone when we call, what do we do? We pick up the phone when they call. Because this is the real question. And Yemen is a great example. Nothing happens in Yemen from 12 a.m., uh, sorry, p.m., to 7 p.m. People start calling you at 9, 10, 11, something to do with cut and other things. So, of course, you could say, sorry, no. Okay. But then you will call back one day, and they will say, sorry, no. So, the idea is that you have to maintain these contacts. And again, I'm looking at practitioners who think about this. You are in charge of your security. You will have security advisors who would tell you this is safe, this is unsafe. It's great. They know what they're talking about. But at the end of the day, it's you. You decide on your own security. You decide on the security of your team. You decide on the security of the operation, which means that some people will be deprived of aid they will need because you made a foolish decision or because you made the wrong decision. So it's an important decision to take. And you cannot outsource this even internally, saying it's not me, it's the security guys. No, it's you. If you decide to send the team there, it's you. So start preparing for this. Because again, this is not a spectator sport. We're not talking about, OK, what's going to happen in the next World Cup? We're talking about things you will be doing, and some of you are already doing. Um, just uh, one minute on the Kunduz incident. And it's an MSF incident, and it's awful. There are no words to describe it. I'm very happy that you're engaging with the US military. Uh, two things on that. First, read the report. And I mean it. Read the report. Don't read what you know, the Belgium newspaper said about the report. Read the report. Read the report for real. Then go and read the Human Rights Watch report on the incident. Then read the MSF report on the incident. This is crucially important. But again, you have, we have a choice, each one of us, on these issues. Do you want to be my mother, who is just skimming through these things and assuming that the Americans are bad and MSF are good and her, her son is a doctor because he works for the ICRC? Okay, 
That's her vision of the world. I'm not a doctor. Don't, please don't tell my mom. <laughs> and there's another way to look at it, which is to say, okay, this is serious. This is my job. This is what I want to do. So I'm going to dig into this. I'm going to try to understand how it works. And you're absolutely right. If you don't know what close air support means, if you don't know what kind of bombs were used, if you don't know if it was a drone or if it was an F-16, then you cannot have a professional opinion about what happened. Now, I have good news for you. We actually teach a course on these things in NOAA. <laughs> so you can come and join. Or you can start getting interested in these things if you think this is, this is important. If you don't know what is the system in place by the Americans, and no, I'm not American, and I have a lot of things to say about the humanitarian behavior of US forces, firsthand, I've worked for a long time for the ACRC with the Americans, including in Guantanamo. So I know, I can, in this one, I'm really talking out of knowledge. If you don't know how the Americans manage civilian casualties in Afghanistan, thanks to organizations like Civic and ICRC and others. If you don't know what is the system that is in place, how they do their, 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 their actually inquiries, how they compensate, you cannot have a professional opinion about what happened in Kunduz. And you're absolutely right. We know probably 30 or 40 percent of the story, but it's more than enough to have a professional opinion about it. So the question is, do you want to focus on these things? And they're very specific. We're talking here about protection of civilians in in context where air force is used. It's very specific. It has nothing to do with what my colleague here is doing. And what he is doing is great. He is saving lives every day with his team. But all these conversations are irrelevant for him. So you have to choose which one is you're interested in because you will not be able to be an expert in all of them. But again, don't look at this as a spectator sport. I read it in the newspaper. The Americans are bad because they have Guantanamo and because they bomb Kunduz. Mm -hmm. I know you want me to stop. I will stop in a second. Last, just la la last point uh, for me that is important. Think about this as you in the hot seat. It's not about something you're watching. It's something that you will be doing. And start getting ready for this. What does it mean for you? What do you need to know? Train yourself, get better, get feedback on these things. Don't just watch it and say, Yes, the polio campaign was a disaster. Yes, of course it was a disaster. But then the question is, what do we do with it? How do we stop it next time? Okay, thank, thank you very much. I would like to give the chance to yes. Jackson and then to audience. So please be brief. Okay, thank you so much. I just want to respond to the gentleman who asked whether it is good to work uh, for NGOs to work as a group or in a fragmented way. Uh, I think from what uh, you know, Bob has already been saying, uh, that yes, it is good to work in a group, maybe for coordination purposes, and also maybe for trying to influence what uh, the government uh, can do to ensure the protection of uh, aid workers. But at the end of the day, the responsibility falls on the NGO to be responsible for their own staff. Okay, I would want to just give a, a quick example of what has been happening in South Sudan. Um, the, 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 the NGO, um, uh, for, I mean, the NGO forum uh, came together and, uh, you know, they constituted a steering committee and they've been pushing for increased patrols in residential areas where also our national staff are staying uh, because, you know, there's been a change uh, in the security of our national staff where they are being targeted for, I mean, by criminals uh, because at least for them they are earning an income but you'd find that you know, the security forces, the civil service, they are not being paid in time and they are still earning the national currency. So they don't have enough money you know, to take care of their own families. So because of that, there's been an increase, a, a spike in the number of uh, uh, cases where NGO st uh, staff have been targeted uh, for robberies and other criminal activities. And some of them have been killed in other locations. So already, you know, the government has tried to improve in terms of uh, uh, patrols in residential areas. Um, whether they are going to maintain that for a long time, uh, we are not very sure, but this is uh, currently happening. Uh, so it's because of, uh, you know, coordination. But at, at the end of the day, we are the ones who are responsible for our own staff. Okay. So thank you very much. Maybe two questions I noticed, you and you. 
I hope you, you agree to be attacked during the break with questions. <laughs> I love to be. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have much time. But two more questions, please. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, I just have a, a couple of points. One being, I think possibly on this panel, we have a very clear uh, example of, of, the Re of the Red Crescent and of MSF, who have their, a very, very particular approach to security in uh, country missions. And if we're going to go out into the field as humanitarian workers, the likelihood is you're not going to work for these two organizations. And so, I, I think, um, and the, the point is that um, if you're working for like a run-of-the-mill humanitarian organization, we have our own approach, which is usually much better coordinated than the Red Crescent or the or MSF with each other. We're, we're working closely together, and um, the separation that you have in your approach is totally, I think, not applicable to it, the way that we work. It's very unlikely that you're going to be in a mission uh, far away from the capital by yourself. This almost doesn't happen if you're an expatriate, I would say. You're probably going to be in the capital city, in an office, and it'll be the national staff that are making these security decisions far, far away, and you're just being informed. Um, and that has, a, I mean, uh, attacks, and the way that we operate our security has a massive direct effect on the way that other organizations are perceived. So, for example, in Afghanistan, when NRC was attacked, they started using armored cars in Kabul. When one organization starts using armored cars, it means every other organization is at massive risk of being attacked. Because the security has gone from acceptance to, what's the next stage, deterrence? deterrence? Protection. Or Protection. Deterrence. Um, so you all, by your own nature of using soft skin cars, become a softer target. So the, the, the measures that we take do have to be coordinated. And that's why we have such strong organizations like INSO who are coordinating between all of us. The, the part that um, the Red Crescent and the ICRC and um, MSF plays is, is totally different from how normal organizations work on their security. Normal, and <laughs> normal standard uh, humanitarian, and it, it's true, and that's something that has to be, um, I think that we have to uh, give some notice to that because that's not how PAR works and it's not how any of the other organizations I've worked with works uh, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Um, so that's probably worth saying. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And please, the other lady. Thank you, Catherine Kramer from Geneva Call. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, or uh, re-echo what was being said about understanding the dynamic of the situation you're working in. Um, and just because a country has opened up, that there's ceasefires, that there's peace talks, does not mean the conflict is over. Um, if you're a humanitarian aid worker and you're going into areas controlled by armed groups, I know under the law, you're not, you know, you're not required to go to the armed groups and get their consent if it's a non-international armed conflict. But for safety, for security, for access, it's incredibly important. And also to be aware that it's not just enough to get the local commander's um, consent, you need to get the leadership's consent. And the reason is, is sometimes, and I can take the case of Burma, Myanmar, that the groups are struggling with command control issues. If you go and just get the commander's issue, you may become a PNG by the leadership, and then your access to other areas may change. Um, and luckily, so far, there hasn't been such an issue of attacks that I'm aware of yet on uh, humanitarian workers um, from the armed groups operating in these areas. But it's just to make sure that also when you say you're going to do something, you do what you say you're going to do, how you're going to do it. Be transparent. We talk a lot with the armed groups, and they don't trust humanitarians. They don't trust them, especially if you're coming in from government-controlled areas. Um, and we actually, I, re I read recently from a field report that um, one brigade area was like, no, we're not going to let someone in. There had to be discussions. 
the person talked about working on mine risk education, victim assistance, et cetera, and then the person was like, oh, you're, you're connected somehow with Geneva College? Oh, okay, then we'll let you in, because they knew who we were doing, what we were doing. So sometimes that helps the, the linkages, but it's also to be clear that you do have to establish trust, um, and again, state is not enough, uh, and, and so forth. So I just wanted to echo what others were saying, and just to be very careful when you're operating in these areas to be aware of the situation, et cetera. Um, and I know it is sometimes difficult for humanitarian actors to actually go and talk with armed groups, that there's sometimes within organizations a resistance to do that, um, but it is necessary if you're in those situations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to comment with two sentences at the end? <laughs> the last comment? Mm -hmm. Last comment. Yeah, just uh, comment on, on what you said. I'm, I'm afraid that, that you are right. Um, but uh, the question is, should be the, that way. I mean, if we, MSF, CRC, we are able to, to, to deploy in the field in those sensitive areas, uh, other organizations also can. But you need to invest in, in that. And the problem is that uh, we see that we are not investing in those kind of uh, scenarios. I mean, First, because we are becoming multi-mandate, in charge of many different things. Of course, you cannot really uh, work in, in places where, I mean, working in highly security contests is very expensive, very expensive. Sometimes you need to book your own flights. Uh, we have MSF planes even, of course, uh, ICRC does, it's expensive. Uh, it's a bit more dangerous than working in other places. Uh, you need really to, to put and the, 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 say the backup, best capacity, I meaning human resources, attention, time, in those, uh, in those scenarios. For in Yemen, for us, it's like 60 million euros only in Yemen. Uh, it's a challenge organization. But of course, you can also do it, and, and, uh, but you need, to, you need to invest in that. And actually, this is the roots of the humanitarian action. Uh, the, the, the very origin of humanitarian action is to work in those uh, kind of places. Uh, the problem is that we are less and less people uh, working there. And, and we think this is a choice. Uh, I think the, the humanitarian sector has chosen uh, uh, to disinvest in that, uh, in, in working acute emergencies and highly security uh, context, and it shouldn't be um, in that way. Have this and this, I uh, recognize this is difficult. And I, we talk about the emergency gap, let's say, in that many, uh, we are alone in many places, but it's also true that we are not in every place. We have also, we draw for certain places uh, because we, we were not able to work. I'm referring to certain places in Libya, <coughs> in Somalia for, for some time. So this is difficult. But we should try. And you should try because I would like to insist in those places, very often, not always, but very often is where people, where uh, needs are most acute. I mean, very often uh, this, this happens. And just to finish uh, my contribution, I know uh, that I would not, not like to, to discourage you to, to become a humanitarian workers, and uh, not at all. I mean, I think this is probably the, one of the best professions you, can, you may have, uh, the most challenging, so interesting. So I really like uh, this, this, um, um, this, this, this work. I mean, this, this panel was really to go into details, this kind of things, but of course, we are talking about extreme uh, uh, cases. So please not be uh, discouraged. I think NOAA is the right place as well to learn. I'm a former NOAA student. I did uh, the master's program like 20 years ago, something like that. So please do not be discouraged by, by my work. Uh, the other way around, just try your best and, because it's, it's worthwhile. Thank, thank you. you very much. Robert, your last comment. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I can only agree with uh, Alessandro. I'm not sure you will not be recruited by the ICRC or MSF. I mean, <laughs> if, if you want, you will be. But I, I just think I, I agree and we, we, that uh, it, it's true. Um, I think there is a point that is important, and you touched upon, it, upon that. Um, we didn't mention that, and I would be remiss if I don't do it. Um, the risk transfer. You mentioned sitting in the capital and letting local staff. This is not a way, this doesn't mean that you fix your security problem. That means that you transfer the risk somewhere else. And we have to be aware of this. And you as humanitarian workers have to be aware of this. There's a lot to be said about local organizations doing the last mile, which happens to be last 100 miles, where, which happens to be the most dangerous. Uh, and then it's like, it's not us, it's them. They know. And there's this thing that drives me crazy, which is like, they're local, so they know. Really? Like, most of the people killed in Syria today are actually locals. 
So most of the people killed in Central African Republic are actually locals. So I think this is important. We didn't get a chance to, to mention it. My very last point is that none of us mentioned anything about online in this conversation. And for me, this is very, very, very worrying. It's not coming next because next is only about monitoring and evaluation. If we think that security is only about direct contacts and that what happens online is irrelevant to security, we're just completely out of our minds. We're crazy. Monitoring what's happening online, engaging with the people online, engaging with the parties to the conflict is at the core of a security strategy and of an acceptance strategy. And I'm very worried that we didn't mention that today. Exactly like Ma uh, Madame Bragg was very worried about the fact that we didn't mention health issues. So of course it's only two hours, but I'm just saying don't forget these and not because we didn't mention them during this conversation, they're not at the core of this. And then I encourage you to read this where there's a very nice chapter about security. Okay, and last minute for Jackson. Okay, thank you so much. I think most of the points have already been said. I just wanted to make one more a point in terms of uh, you know, the security of our national staff. Um, in the context such as South Sudan, you would find that uh, in the other communities, being employed as a humanitarian worker and you are a national staff is in itself a risk. Uh, like in locations uh, where you know, there have always been these conflicts between communities, uh, you would find that you know, when you are now waking, you are a target for revenge killing. Uh, it has happened before with some other agencies um, in, in, in South Sudan where some national staff were targeted for revenge killings because now they are seen as a trophy. Like if we target this one, now we can now get our way back at this, uh, at this community for having attacked us before because they will cry a lot because this is the breadwinner. So some, uh, you know, these things happen. And also you'd find that some national staff cannot work in certain locations or when they work there, they are threatened. But also you'd find in terms of uh, education, some of the uh, regional areas in South Sudan, that's where the most educated of the national staff come from. So generally it's natural that uh, an NGO would employ from there and deploy to the other states. But those people, and uh, also those youths in those other states, they feel that their jobs are being taken away. So there are a lot of threats, you know, that happen. Even though they haven't um, translated into actual physical attack on the staff, as uh, humanitarian workers there, we always try to make sure that, you know, we pull out our staff from there if they are threatened in any way. Thank you very much, and last three sentences from me. The first, there is no one key to improve the situation. One key lies in governmental hands, the second one in non-governmental hands. The second one is don't be too cynical, don't criticize just law, don't condemn the law, but perpetrators. And the first sentence is that we are really proud that you joined us here, that you visited the University of Warsaw. We had really outstanding experts. Thank you very much. I think it was extremely interesting what happened here. Thank you for your participation.